Good morning. My name is Josh Kelpine. I'm a senior at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, and it is my privilege to share God's word with you here this morning. You can see the theme that we're going to be using for worship this morning up on the screen behind me here. A day of terror for all those who troubled God's people. We're in a season of the church year now that has sometimes been known as the end times. It's the time in between Pentecost and before Advent as we're getting ready for Jesus' birth. And there's really two ways that we can take that statement. The one is we can throw our hands up in despair and say, we had persecution. How, how are we going to keep going in this world? The other is to think that vengeance or justice is somehow determined by us, and we have to carry that out. Well, actually, the certainty of the last day gives us an answer to both of those things. On the one hand, it tells us that on the last day, God will be the righteous judge, judging those people who both have loved the Lord and have feared him in, in righteousness. And also those who have acted up against God's people. It also gives us an answer for those days that we feel despair. And saying we can stand up for the gospel. And we can proclaim God's truth. Because on the last day he will take us to be with him forever. And he promises that. And his promises never fail. So really in this text for today we have the answers to both of those questions. I'm going to be meditating on for our sermon on Revelation chapter 22, where we hear about God's perfect paradise, which is awaiting us in heaven. Uh, we look forward to meditating on the different readings that we have for today and singing the hymns that we have for today as well. Everything you need for worship you can find in your hymnals or on the screen behind me. Uh, your bulletins can help out with some of that as well. We will be using the service setting too. You can find that on page 172 in the front of your hymnals or on the screen behind me as well. But we'll open with our first hymn. That's hymn number 493. Rejoice, rejoice believers.
please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and the day of your righteous judgments. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes to us from the Old Testament book of Malachi, chapter 4. These are actually the very last words of the Old Testament, and they present two things. They present judgment on people who do not believe in God, but they also provide encouragement and gospel for those who do. It says, the Son of Righteousness will come with healing in his wings. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. God became man to set us free, to provide us with healing. We hear these words from Malachi chapter 4. Look, the day is coming, burning like a blast furnace. All the arrogance and every evildoer will be stubble. The day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord of armies. A day that will not leave behind a root or a branch for them, but... For you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise, and there will be healing in its wings. You will go out and jump around like calves from the stall. You will trample the wicked. They will surely be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I take action, says the Lord of armies. Remember the law of my servant Moses, which I commanded to him at Horeb to serve as statutes and judgments over all Israel. Look, I am going to send Elijah the prophet to you before the great and fearful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with complete destruction. The word of the Lord. We continue with the singing of Psalm number 98. You can find that in the front of your hymnals or on the screen behind me. We'll sing that psalm in unison this morning.
Our second reading this morning comes to us from the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. The people in Thessalonica were experiencing persecution, and so there is hope for them. In really two ways. One is that those who are causing this persecution of them, on the last day, they will be done away with. God will do away with them. But for those who are faithful to God's word, they will receive uh, a marvelous splendor on the last day when they are with God forever in heaven. We read from 2 Thessalonians. This is evidence of God's righteous verdict that resulted in your being counted worthy of God's kingdom, for which you also suffer. Certainly, it is right for God to repay trouble to those who trouble you, and to give relief to you who are being troubled along with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his powerful angels, he will exercise vengeance and flaming fire on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Such people will receive a just penalty, eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from his glorious strength. On that day, when he comes to be glorified among his saints and to be marveled at among those who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. The word of the Lord. Please stand to acclaim the gospel. The gospel for this morning comes to us from Luke's gospel, chapter 21, verses 5 through 19, where Jesus makes it clear that even the temple that they were in was going to be destroyed, and when God comes again on the last day, there will be destruction and bad things in this world, but for those who persevere, they will not be touched, because they will be in heaven forever with him. We hear these words of Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. As some were talking about the temple, how it was decorated with beautiful stones and offerings, Jesus said, These things that you see here, the days will come. Well, there will not be one stone left on another. Every one will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will these things happen? And what is the sign that these things are about to happen? He said, Watch out so that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. Whenever you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be terrified, for these things must happen first. But the end will not be right then. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and plagues in various places. There will be horrifying sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, handing you over to synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will turn out to be your opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand how to defend yourselves, for I will give you the words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed Even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all people for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By patient endurance, you will gain your lives. The Gospel of the Lord. The congregation may be seated, and at this time I'd like to call the children forward for the children's message. Good 
Good morning. How are you doing? I like your Sonic sweatshirt and your Minnie Mouse sweatshirt. It's pretty cool. What is your favorite place to be in the world? If you could just be in one place all the time, where would it be? The zoo, right? The zoo's pretty awesome. Yeah? Do you have a favorite place? Yeah? What is it? Also the zoo? In our sermon for today, we're going to be talking about an unbelievable place. A place that's even better than the zoo. Because you know what happens? When you go to the zoo, there's a time when you have to leave the zoo, right? And sometimes we might be a little sad when we leave the zoo. What are the monkeys or the giraffes or the tigers going to do without us, right? And those times can make us sad, and we go back to real life, and sometimes we get owies, we fall down, and we, we hurt ourselves. And sometimes we don't get to play with the toys we want to play with, and sometimes we have to go to bed. And all those things maybe aren't our favorite. And these bad things, like getting hurt and things, happen because there is what we call sin in the world. See, before... Adam, when Adam and Eve were made, in the very beginning, there was no sin in the world. But they disobeyed God, they went against what he said, and then sin was in the world. So now there's bad things, and things that make us cry, and things that make us not very happy. We have little glimpses, or little times in our lives where we get to have really good times, right? Like when we go to the zoo. But in our sermon for today, we're going to hear about a time where we will forever be in the most wonderful place ever, a place even better than the zoo. We call that place heaven, and it'll be the best place ever because we will be with Jesus forever there, and we'll never have to leave, and we'll never have to have owies or anything that makes us sad in heaven because of what Jesus did for you in dying on the cross. He'll come back again one day to take you to be with him forever in heaven. That sounds even better than the zoo, right? And who knows, there may even be some animals in heaven. We'll see, huh? But we know it'll be the best place ever. Can we say a prayer about that? And then we'll get candy? Yeah? Dear Heavenly Father, as we are here on this earth, we have problems, and that's because of our sinfulness. But we know that your son Jesus came to this earth and died on the cross to take away the punishment for our sins and give to us eternal life in heaven. We look forward to that day where we can spend every single day with you in heaven, the most perfect place in the world. In your name we pray. Here's a piece of candy. Thanks for listening well. We will continue our service now with the singing of hymn number 488. The day is surely drawing near.
Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was and who is and who is to come. Amen. I'm not going to be preaching on any of the three lessons that we read this morning. Instead, I'm going to be preaching on Revelation chapter 22. But it fits. We are now in a series of the church year, a part of the church year that we sometimes call the last days or the end times or the second coming, as you saw maybe on the top of the hymnal on the section of the hymns that we are singing. And in some ways, this is like the New Year's Eve of the church year, as we get ready for the new church year to start with the season of Advent. And on these Sundays in end times, we talk about Jesus coming again to this earth. And we see clearly in our readings that this day will be a day of trouble, a day of dread, a day of warning for those who did not love the Lord. And for those who troubled those who loved the Lord. But we also see that this second coming of our Lord and Savior is a day of great glory for us who live as Christians. It will be a day where we get to experience paradise forever with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the book of Revelation, which we go to today, is full of pictures of that wonderful paradise that we will receive when we are with the Lord, even though there will be suffering and there will be pain and there will be hardship as we are here on this earth. Before I read the text to you, I have to ask a question, and it's pretty much the same exact question I asked to the kids in the children's message, and that's, what's your paradise? Maybe our paradise is going to Lambeau Field to watch the Packers play. Wow. Sitting with 80,000 other people cheering on the team, now that's paradise. For some of us, that may be going hunting, right? Sitting in the stand and seeing God's great creation and saying, wow, I'm in paradise. For some of us, maybe that's going to some place warm when the rest of the world is in winter and saying, ah, I'm in paradise sitting on the beach. Could be with people. Or maybe you like to get up to the mountains by yourself and sit in the quietness and listen to the leaves fall from the trees and the wind blow and say, ah, this is, this is paradise. Now that I have you all daydreaming about whatever your paradise is, I'm going to ask you to redirect your minds a little bit back as I read our text, but keep that in the back of your head. What really is your paradise? As I read to you these words, they were words given to the Apostle John as he was exiled on the island of Patmos. Certainly would not have felt like a paradise. We may say to ourselves, well, he's on an island. That sounds great. But he wanted to be with God's people. He wanted to continue in sharing the message about Jesus to all people, and this prevented him from doing so. So this island was not a paradise for him. Instead, it was a torture. And I think he probably thought about our theme for this Sunday quite often. Those who have troubled me here on this earth will experience trouble on the last day. But I think he also thought about and had the strong confidence that no matter what happens to me on this earth, no matter if I am on a, stranded on an island, no matter if they take me and behead me or throw me into prison, any of those things, I know that this last day will come and I will live in true paradise with my Savior forever. Wow! 
Think about those things as I read to you the words from Revelation chapter 22. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was a tree of life bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit in every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need for the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. These are the words of the Apostle John as he presents them the vision that God gave to him on the island of Patmos. Now, you know that these books, these, these words come from the book of Revelation because I told you so. But do they sound at all familiar to you from somewhere else in the Bible? They actually sound quite similar to the description that we get of the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2. I'm, I'm going to read a couple of verses from Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to think of the similarities between what John has seen, this perfect paradise, and the paradise that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. These are the verses from Genesis chapter 2. Now the Lord God had planted in a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. You can see how similar it is. I'm going to bring us back to that story the creation story in Genesis. God placed Adam and Eve in this Garden of Eden, and, and there were two trees, right? You heard about it, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God gave to Adam and Eve one command. He said to them, you can eat from any of the trees in the garden. And there were probably a lot with a lot of nice fruit on it. But the one tree you cannot eat from, that is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then the serpent came and said, Did God really say? Well, I mean, I, I suppose if it's one apple, you know. And they disobeyed God's command. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and because of that, the perfection that was theirs there in the Garden of Eden was no longer. And God placed the curse on Adam and Eve and on the serpent. He said to them, look, now you will toil in the fields all the days of your life. There will no longer just be this garden that is watered by this river that comes from Eden with all the food that you want to eat. You'll have to work. There will be sweat. There will be pain in childbearing. And there will be sin on this earth. And that could not have been made any more clear to them as they saw their own children murder one another only a little bit bit after this probably but he also put a curse on the serpent which would serve as the promise for adam and eve and for all those christians who were to come i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers he will crush your head you will strike his heel he speaks it directly to the devil I will send a Savior, and that Savior will crush your head. That Savior will do away with sin, death, and the devil. But as long as they are on this earth, there will be sin. There will be this thing that doesn't feel right. There will be persecution. There will be hardship. All because God's perfection was broken by the disobedience of Adam and Eve. It doesn't 
take long to look around this earth and to say to yourself, this life is not a paradise. Yes, you can go to the beach for a week, or you can go to the mountains for a week and have a wonderful vacation. But you know as well as I do, it doesn't take very long when you come back that suddenly all the problems of this earth are back there with you. You open your email, and there from work are 20 things you already have to do the next day. The relationships that were strained, you come back to, and they're still strained. There is still sin in this world, and you even feel that once in a while while you are on vacation. But there can be a temptation, and that is for us to say, if I just have this thing, well, I am here on this earth, then I will have paradise. If I just have a little bit more money on this earth, then the paradise that we hear described in Eden or described in this vision to John, then that will be mine. I will somehow live in perfection if I have that extra vacation or if that relationship is just mended. Then I will have perfection. You know, it is interesting if you read people who lived at times where they were not as blessed as we are today, they look forward to the second coming of Jesus quite a bit. They talk about it all the time. The early Christians thought that Jesus was coming back soon, and they really wanted Jesus to come back soon because they were experiencing persecution and hardship and troubles. And now I'm not saying that they were holier than us somehow, but I think that it can be instructive to think about how they looked forward to that day with urgency. Because that day is coming soon, Jesus says. They greatly look forward to that day. But as we live in a world that has so many material blessings and we can drive places and earth feels like it's pretty good, sometimes we lose sight of that last day. But sin still remains. Because we are still under that curse from the Garden of Eden. And we will be as long as this life endures. And so we feel that struggle between, yes, the good things that are in this world and the heaven that we already know is ours and our own sinful nature that wants to go away from God and apart from God and wants nothing to do with God. There's another temptation. And that's to think that there is something we can do to contribute to the perfection of this earth. We say to ourselves, if so and so wins the election, then there will be paradise here on this earth. Or if this social problem was fixed, then there will be paradise here on this earth. Or if we just, you know, took better care of the environment, then there would be this paradise like the garden that we hear here on this earth. But there never will be. Because as long as we live on this earth, there will always be sin and creation will always be corrupted. So yes, God gives us government to help us, and we, we, we should use that government and see that government as a gift from God. And he gives us the environment, and we should treat that in a way that God would have us treat that, right? But that ultimately is not what gives us paradise here on this earth. And focusing only on the here and now and on the things of this earth will ultimately drive us to a place where we want none of that paradise in heaven. And we'll even despise the paradise of heaven or ourselves be afraid of that day that is to come, judgment day. But remember, God promised that he would send a savior. He promised that this broken world that we live in today would be mended. He promised that one day he would come. And that promise that he made to Adam and Eve, he kept. And if you just flip your pages 
through the Old Testament, you will see how God preserved that promise of a Savior throughout terrible times for his people. Two captivities preserved it. The time of the judges where everyone just did whatever they wanted preserved it. When Elijah thought he was the only one left on earth, he preserved it. In the reading we hear from Malachi, when the the people came back from Babylon and, and they saw that things weren't the way they used to be in Jerusalem and they were sad. And when God seemed to go silent for 400 years, he preserved his promise. And as we come on this Advent season, which is coming shortly, we see that Savior Jesus coming into this world. And he came into this world that was so incredibly broken, that had difficulties, had social problems, had governmental problems. And he said, yeah, those things endure, but I am coming to take on the sins of the world. And he went and lived a perfect life and then died on the cross so that his name is written on your forehead. And so that you already, even though as you live on this earth, you fight against that sinful nature and you fight against the things of the world, you already have a place in heaven. That causes you, as the prophet Malachi said in our one reading, to jump like calves out of the stall. You have been set free. Last night in the Mequon area where I was, the, the power was out, right? And that darkness just puts you down, kind of. It feels like the only thing there is to do is sleep or whatever. But Jesus comes and he provides light in the darkness. He provides you and I with eternal salvation, eternal life, eternal life with him through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And because that place in heaven, that name is written on your forehead, now you have opportunity to go out and tell people about it so that they can experience the same joy that you and I experience because Jesus has set us free from sin, has set us free from darkness, has given us to the light, has given us to paradise. He's done away with the curse. And you get to tell people about that joy that's yours. And in doing so, you not only give them that joy, but you also spare them of that judgment. And the Holy Spirit will work through your words. And some people will meet that with rejection and persecution. And others will come to faith. But in either circumstance, you can be so sure of your place in heaven. Your name is already written there because of what Jesus has done for you. Yes, paradise was lost in the beginning. But paradise has been restored through the blood of Jesus Christ and will be restored fully on that last day. And it is yours and it is mine through faith in Christ Jesus. And that causes us to leap like calves being released from the stall. Listen one more time as I read to you the words of Revelation chapter 22. And you hear of that wonderful paradise, heaven, that is for you and for me soon. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruits, yielding its fruits every month. And the leaves were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. 
and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and there will no longer be any night and they will not have need for a light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. That's your paradise. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all our human understanding May that guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Please stand as we join in confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed this morning. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. Scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the prayer. We pray. O oh Lord, in these last days we lift our eyes to your Son, Jesus Christ, from whom our help comes. Turn us from distress and fear of what is coming on our world to stand confidently in the word of Christ, which will never pass away. Heavenly Father, uphold all ministers of your gospel and those who hear it gladly, especially all persecuted Christians. Cause that your, wor your word be honored and so deliver them from wicked and evil men. Give a mouth and wisdom to your people in all advers adversity to confess you boldly and to endure faithfully to the end. We worship you, O Lord, for all your loving kindness shown to us in Christ our Savior. Deliver us from fear as we witness the signs of the time and make sober judgment in the face of so many vexing concerns. Remind us that though the nations rage and the powers press against the church, this is our opportunity to give witness to the word that does not change and the mercy that is our hope in Christ. Lord God, we have this command from your blessed apostles that we are to be busy at work and not walk in idleness. Strengthen us in the Lord Jesus Christ to do good without weariness. Bless the homes and busyness of this congregation and give to our people the fruits of their labors. Grant that in the conduct of life's work, our hearts may always be directed to the love and of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Merciful Father, straighten and raise the heads of your people to look for the resurrection at the last day and to live, in the, in, live and endure in hope since your redemption draws near. As the days pass and all things move to their appointed end, keep us from being complacent Keep us alert and awake so that when the day comes, we may greet the Lord and rejoice in his eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue now with the offering.
Please stand. that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks. O Lord, our Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with him to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give, you, we give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive us our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
congregation may be seated. At this time, we will do the distribution of the Lord's Supper. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. And now take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. May this true body and blood which you have received in this Holy Supper strengthen and preserve you in the true faith, both now and to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for the forgiveness of all of your sins.
our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude our service with the singing of hymn number 485, Day of Wrath. You may be seated.
Good morning once again to all of you, and it's been a privilege to share God's word and worship with you here this morning. A number of announcements here. Uh, first is that the Shoreland Craft Fair is on November 19th. Uh, some of the young girls of Water of Life have made Polish bread necklaces to support the Ukrainian Lutheran Church, and we thank them for their efforts. Go check those out at the Shoreland Craft Fair. Uh, there will be Thanksgiving Eve services at both campuses, uh, 4.30 p.m. at the Racine campus, 6.30 p.m. here at the Caledonia campus. Uh, give thanks to the Lord for the many things that he has given to us, and uh, it's on the eve, so you aren't going to miss any of the football games, I guess. Uh, register for the Happy Birthday Jesus event on December 3rd. That takes place at 9 a.m. at the Water of Life Racine campus. Fellowship Hall. On the Thirsty Podcast this week, Pastor Lightning and Pastor Zarling interviewed Pastor Selno and discussed multi-site ministry. It uh, might be worth listening to as that's kind of what's going on here as we see how the multi-site thing works. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call Mr. Ring forward and he's going to give a, a brief talk on uh, the school. So, yeah. time there's a little bit of a video from the Wells Youth Night. I'll admit to you it's kind of fast and, and, and jerky. That's a forewarning so if you get really dizzy you might want to put your head down for at least part of it.
Well, there you can see just some of the fun that they had at uh, Wells Youth Night, and thanks for your support of, of that. Wells Youth Night as well, a, a good thing to bring kids at that age together and letting them share in time with each other. That's always good to develop strong Christian friendships uh, at, at that age, and um, Wisconsin Lutheran School certainly does that too. So. Uh, we are excited to announce that Pastor Wagner has accepted our vacancy call, so he will begin serving us on November 27th, so you'll be seeing more familiar faces uh, preaching at the two places. We thank Pastor Wagner for accepting that call. We, we give thanks to God for that, and we pray that his ministry among us here at Water of Life be, uh, be a blessing to him and a blessing to you as well. Uh, may God bless you as you go out this day, rejoicing in that second coming. Uh, that is uh, a wonderful day where we'll be in paradise with our, our Lord and Savior forever. forever. Uh, feel free to stick around after the service and greet one another, encourage one another in faith and in life. I'll meet you at, at the back door.